Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Terrorscape. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing an entire game today. Now, before I go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to a wide variety of exclusive perks, then please go to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. Some of those perks include watching my dozens of opinions episodes, where I go in depth about the things I like and don't like about all the games that I'm playing recently, and I update my thoughts as I continue to play those games. Also, you can gain access to some videos early and advertisement free, and get access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of all of the vlogs that I make, including those opinions episodes. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this, some part of the game really jumps out to you as particularly interesting, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play. Now, before we start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. The other thing I'd like to mention is that today I'm filming with a prototype version of the game. That means the art and components that you see here might not match those in the final version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of this one versus many game. Now, in the game, one person is going to be controlling the killer, and everyone else is going to be working together to try and survive. Now, out here we have a mansion, and it's a stormy night, and most of the players are essentially travelers who snuck into the mansion to try and avoid the storm, not realizing they were about to get locked in with a killer. Now, every time you play the game, there will always be three survivors, no matter how many people are actually playing, and there are more survivors than the ones we see right here. Today, we're going to be simulating a two-player game where one person is controlling all of the survivors, and the other player is controlling the killer. Now, as you can see, the killer sits on the other side of this mansion piece, and there is a map in front of them that is identical to the map in front of the survivors. Now, there are multiple different killers that come in the game. For example, there is a murderer as well as a specter, but today we are going to be playing with the butcher. So this player is controlling the butcher, and their entire goal is to kill one of the survivors. They do this by damaging a survivor twice, and we can track their health up here. And again, we'll talk about all the details of this while we're actually playing. Now, the key thing to keep in mind is that the killer is back here, and they can see a map of the mansion, and they know where they are, but they don't know where the survivors are. While at the same time, the survivors always know where the killer is, unless they go stealth, and I'll talk about stealth later on in the video. So, the survivors are going to be trying to avoid the killer as much as possible, and in order for them to win, they need to find five keys and make their way out the main exit, or if they get those keys and find a hidden map, they can escape via this hidden exit. The other option for them is they can repair a radio, which is noisy business, and if they get that radio repaired and wait five rounds without any of them dying to the killer, then the survivors will win. Now, the structure of the game involves all of the survivors taking their turns, then the killer will take their turn, then it comes back and all the survivors will go again, and this will keep happening until one side of the table is going to win. All of the survivors will win or lose together. Along the way, the survivors can pick up various items, while the murderer is going to be getting stronger as they continue to cycle through a deck of skill cards that is specific to that killer. Now, as I mentioned before, I will describe how all of this works while we're playing, and I think this is a good enough time to start. Once again, I'm simulating a two-player game where one person is controlling all of the survivors. Obviously, if it was a three-player game, then two players would share the control of these three survivors together, and if you had a four-player game, then each player could control one of the survivors. Now, the way the game works is the survivors are going to take their first turn, and they are all going to be activating before it's time for the killer to go. There are several steps that happen during each of the survivor turns, and the first of these involves removing noise tokens and checking to see if the survivors have won. Now, we haven't placed any noise tokens, and we certainly haven't won yet, so we'll skip past that, and I'll explain it in more detail later on in the tutorial. So, we can move to the next step of the survivor turn, where any survivors who are in the same location may trade items back and forth, and they can perform any extra actions they have. Extra actions generally show up on items, and at the beginning of the game, one of the players started with a specific item. Marco Carvin has Marco's medkit, and obviously we only get this item if Marco is in the game. Now, I do want to point out that each of the survivors can only hold three items at any point, and they will be discarding items as we play. Obviously, we don't have any items to trade, and we don't have any extra actions. So we can move on to the next step, where all of the survivors can perform one action. Now there are six different action options that each survivor can do, and each of them can only pick one. 
Now, the order in which these survivors perform one action is entirely up to the survivor players. Obviously, we are controlling all of these, so we can decide that. Each of these survivors has their own specific asymmetries that we'll explain as we go. I think let's start by performing an action with Anna. Now, as I mentioned, they can perform one action out of six different options, and the one Anna is going to do is move. Now, when a survivor does a move action, they can move once or twice, and with each movement, they can go into an orthogonally adjacent spot as long as there is a path through there. Anna starts here. In fact, all of the players start here in the main hall because they just walked into the front door and it locked behind them. So that means Anna could move once or twice going through these doors. I do want to point out that outside there are these markers that demarcate these as adjacent zones, even though there isn't specifically a doorway. Now, doorways are important because they can be blocked, and I'll explain how that works later on. For now, though, Anna is just going to move once. I think we want to move them down into the gallery, and the reason for that is because there is a key symbol here. Now, one of the action options involves searching a room that has a key symbol in order to draw a card from the item deck. This is an incredibly important thing to do, because one of the ways we win is by getting five keys, and most of the keys are in this deck, so we have to find them. Now again, it takes an action to do a search, and Anna moved for her action. So that is something we could potentially do on the next turn, unless the uh, killer over here makes our life hard, and we'll see if that actually happens. So we finished Anna's action, and of course we could do an action with the other two survivors. And next up, let's have William perform an action. Now, the option we want to have them do is called a special action. In this prototype, that's called replace action. And again, some of these terms will be different with this prototype. Now, whenever you perform a special action, you will do what that action specifically says. William has one of these printed on their board, and that one is called sprint. That says they can move three times. Remember, the normal move is one or two, but then they have to put a noise down in the destination. In general, noise is bad because the killer can hear it, but we can also use this to our benefit. I think we want to try to lure the killer away from the plans of the other survivors by having William move once, then twice, and then three times here into the den. Then they have to place a noise token down into their destination. Now, we don't actually tell the killer about this just yet. Instead, we'll tell them about all the noise we made at the end of our turn. So by making some noise here, perhaps we'll lure the killer in this direction, which I guess is kind of close to Anna, but it's far away from the living room, which is where we're now going to have Marco move to. The reason for that is because there is a broken radio in the living room, and in order to repair this, we need to perform actions over here, and that is a noisy thing to do. So I want to try and lure the killer away from here so that we can make this repair happen. At this point, all survivors have performed an action, so we can move on to the next step. And in this one, once again, survivors can trade items back and forth if they're in the same area, and they can perform any extra action effects they have. But at this moment, nobody actually has any of these. So once again, before we do the action step, and after the action step, we have the opportunity to trade items and perform those extra actions. And going forward in this video, I'll only mention those specific steps if one or more of the survivors is going to be doing something in that step. After this, we can move to the Discover step. Now, the way this works is we're going to choose one of the survivors, and they are going to draw the top two cards from this deck, and then they're going to keep one of them. Obviously, we have to pick a survivor for this, and I think we'll have Anna draw this. So, Anna can look at these two cards, and it looks like she found an ammo pack and an adrenaline card. Now, each of these are items, and she has to take one of them. This adrenaline has an extra action that lets you move once, and that's certainly nice. And then the ammo pack says it requires a revolver, but it adds four defense. So essentially, if you have a revolver and an ammo pack, you can discard the ammo to use the revolver, essentially shooting it at the killer, and that really helps when you're fighting. Obviously, we're going to try to avoid fighting the killer as much as possible, and this ammo doesn't do anything without a revolver, whereas this adrenaline could be really important for an extra move. So I think Anna is going to keep that and discard the ammo pack. Now, I do want to mention that there are two keys in this Discover deck, but most of the keys are in the item deck. So we might end up finding a key or two from here, but if we want to unlock the door and get out of here, we are going to have to search. Well, the Discover step is done, so we can now move into the final step of the Survivor turn, where they have to communicate to the killer where all noise was made. As you can see, we only put one noise down, but if we put multiple noise down, we would simply tell the killer the specific coordinates of each noise. We don't tell them who made that noise. That is something that they're going to have to try to figure out. Obviously, we only put one noise down, and that went into the den, which is also known as location R4, to help with this communication. So, the killer can take a noise token of their own, and they'll place it in the den. 
Now, the killer has some extra tools up their sleeve over here. Specifically, they have some tokens that match the survivors that are in the game, and they also have some other tokens they could use for their deduction, and they have information cards that describe the abilities of all of the players. This means the killer can see that William has the ability to move three times and then put a sound down in their location, and they know that all of the survivors started in the main hall. So the only way they could have moved over here on this first turn is by using that sprint ability. So using that deduction, the killer can say that they think William is actually the one over here. Now, this is not a binding thing. They can just put these tokens down as helpful reminders wherever they want if they think it makes sense. Well, at this point, the survivor's turn is done, so now it's time for the killer to go. Now, the way their turn works is they're going to start by looking at their hand of cards. Now, they drew three of these randomly from their deck of skill cards at the start of the game. I do want to point out that a very powerful card is placed off to the side. They can't unlock this until they hit a specific level up amount, and I'll explain how that works later on. So again, they draw three cards randomly at the start of the game, and these are the three cards that they have. Now, the killer's turn is split into several steps, and in the first step, they can play as many lightning cards as they want, and they simply do what it says. As you can see, Pursue simply says move once. That means the killer can spend this card in order to move into an adjacent location. And unlike the survivors, every time the killer moves, they have to communicate the location they moved to to the survivors. So the survivors can then update their map on the other side of this board. Now, they don't have to play any lightning bolt cards if they don't want to, but they've decided they're going to play Pursue. So once again, that's going to move them once, and then they can discard this. And they have decided they are going to move to the plantation. They saw this noise over here, and they might have figured out that this might be a distraction, but they still figure they know that there is a survivor over here, and the goal of the killer is simply to kill one of the survivors. In order to do that, they have to damage the survivor twice. The first time they're damaged, this token up here is flipped over, and the second time they're damaged, they're killed. Now, I'm sure I'll explain how they take damage in more detail later on. Primarily, that happens through attacks, which happen when the killer searches and finds a survivor in their specific spot. Now, at this point, the killer does not have any more lightning bolt cards, so they can't play any more. But remember, if they had multiple, they could play as many as they wanted. This means they can move into the second step of their turn, where they can play either one card that has this blue arrow on it, or they could perform two actions. And each of those actions is either a move one or a search action. Now, if we look at their one blue arrow card, it has an extra icon here. That says that they have to discard another card from their hand in order to play this out. Now, this is powerful. That would let them move once, then search, then move again, and search again. But they don't think this is a great moment for that, so they are not going to be playing this blue card. Instead, they're going to do their two actions. Now, again, for each of these actions, they can move or search. And for the first one, they've decided to move into this greenhouse. And for the second one, they're going to move again. Although before they do that, let's talk a little bit about how searching actually works. Now, if they were to search, then instead of moving, they have to ask the survivors if any of them are in the same location as the killer. The survivors must answer truthfully, and if there are any at this location, then the killer immediately attacks them in the order of the killer's choice. As of this moment, though, the killer does not think there's any way that any survivor could be in this greenhouse after just one turn, so they're not going to be searching. Instead, that second action is going to be moving into the reading room. Now, it looks like <laughs> this lure over here of making sound has drawn the killer over here. That might be a good thing, or it might be a bad thing. That has finished the action step for the killer, and now they have the option of playing exactly one hourglass card from their hand as long as they did no attacks on this turn. If they performed at least one attack, then they could not play any of these. Now, they obviously did not attack, and that means they have the option of playing barricade. That says they can block once at their location, and they've decided to do this. So they are going to play barricade, and that means they can take one of these block tokens and then put it onto a door frame that's adjacent to their location. As you can see, the butcher is currently in the reading room, and there are three doors they could block, and they've decided to block this door. Now, this is important because survivors cannot move through blocked doors, and as you can see, the greenhouse has a key symbol, so that is another location where the survivors can search into that item deck to try and find keys. So by doing this, the butcher is making it a lot harder for the survivors to make their way into the greenhouse. Now, I do want to point out that the killer can always move through their own barricades, but if they do, they remove it. 
In fact, if they placed all of their barricades into the mansion, then in order to place a new one, they have to move through a previous one to remove it so that they then have that token to place down later on in the future. Well, that has finished their barricade action, which means the killer can now end their turn by drawing three cards from the top of their deck. So they're going to take those and put those into their hand. And it is worth noting that the killer has a five card hand limit. If they were to draw more cards, but they already had five in their hand, then they do draw the cards, but they immediately discard them. Those new cards do not go into their hand. This is important because every time the killer makes their way through their entire deck, they're going to level up. And each time they level up, that will give them access to various things that are going to make life harder for the survivors. These specific benefits are going to be different with each one of the different types of killers. As you can see, the first level up is going to increase their strength by one. The butcher's starting strength is five, and that would bring it up to six. And we can track that on this board over here. And that makes it harder for the survivors to win an attack against the butcher. Well, the killer's turn is done. So now it's time for the survivors to go. Now I do want to point out that they know exactly where the butcher is. They're in the reading room and they know that this is blocked. Every time a barricade is placed down, the killer has to tell the survivors where that barricade went so that they know that it's there. Now the first thing that happens on every survivor turn is they clear off all of the noise tokens and then they check to see if they have won the game. There are two different ways the survivors can win and the first of these is escape. They can escape if all of them are together at the main hall or over here at the garden and they have five keys. Although in order to escape out the garden, they also have to have the hidden map so they can find that hidden exit. Obviously that is not the case. And the other way the survivors can win is if they repair the radio and then wait five rounds for the rescue to arrive. Obviously, none of these things have happened, so the survivors haven't won. And we can now move on with the main part of their turn where they can each perform an action. And I think let's start with Marco. As I said before, we sent him up to the living room so that he can try to start repairing this broken radio in order to call for rescue. Now the action to repair the radio is quite simple. All you have to do is take one of these repair tokens from the side and place it onto this stack. And then we do have to add a noise because repairing a radio is a noisy venture. That has finished Marco's action. And I do want to point out that as soon as the fifth one of these tokens is placed over here, in that moment, the radio is repaired and we are going to call for help. Once we do that, we're gonna take this rescue token and we'll place it up here on the five spot. Then at the start of each one of the survivor's turns, when we remove our noise, we will also move this forward. And if it is ever at the one spot at the start of a survivor turn and we are to move it off, then the survivors immediately win the game because the rescue arrives. Now, it is important to note that there are two restrictions that stop a player from being able to do a repair radio action. The first is that this cannot happen if the killer is in the same room. The second is that this action can only happen once per overall survivor turn. That means if Anna was also in here, we could not do a second repair radio action because we already did one on this current turn. So at a minimum, it's going to take four more turns to make this happen. And of course, the killer knows that. So they might head over here to try and catch and fight a survivor who's trying to repair the radio. And that's just a risk we have to take. Obviously, that was Marco's only action, and they can't move out of here. And they are just three spaces away from the killer, and the killer moved three spaces on their last turn. So hopefully things will be okay for Marco, but if the killer does end up in that room and searches, they'll find Marco and attack him. Well, as I said, Marco is done with their action, so we can move on to one of the other survivors. And I suppose one thing that we could do is sprint with William again. That would let us move him three times and then put a noise token down. And if we focus over here, we can see that moving three times would let William go one, two, three. We could also go one, two, three. You are allowed to enter and leave the same space as the killer, and the killer doesn't even notice us. The survivors are sneaky, and the killer is only ever going to see us and attack us if they do a search in a room where a survivor is. So we can freely move through, but if you remember from before, the survivors cannot move through this blocked token that the killer put down. Now, one thing we could do is move one, two, three, and have William in the same room as Marco. By doing that, we'll have two survivors, and if the killer makes it over here and searches, the killer is going to attack up to both of them, and William actually has some extra defense. If we look at their player board, it says they gain plus one defense when they are not using a weapon, and currently they don't have a weapon. 
That seems like an okay plan, but we can also see that there is an item searching spot over here in the storage room. William can't quite get there on this turn, which is unfortunate, but we could at least move over there considering the killer is at the other side of the house. And a big thing that we need to do is search for items in that deck to try and find keys in order to unlock a door. With that in mind, I think we're just going to have William try to head to the storage unit as quickly as they can. So yeah, they're going to use their special action a second time, and they'll move three. So they'll go one, two, three, and then drop noise token in the kitchen. Lastly, we have to perform an action with Anna, and we specifically sent her into the gallery last turn so that she could do a search action to find an item on this turn. So let's perform that action. And the way this works is simple. She draws the top card from this deck. And again, this can only happen if you perform that action in a room with the item icon on it. And you cannot perform a search if the killer is in the same room. So fortunately, the killer didn't quite make it over there. I'm sure they would have if they could have on their turn. So let's draw the top card. And it's a key. Nice. That is what we're looking for. There are five keys in this overall deck, so that is pretty good luck right there at the start. And if we look at this card in detail, it says metal clanking with a sound icon. That means normally we'd have to put a sound token down here because we kind of fumble the key and it makes noise as we take it. However, Anna has the meticulous effect that says that she will not place noise tokens whenever she does a search action. So that means we don't actually put a noise token down. And it is worth noting that many of the cards in this deck are not metallic, which means they don't put a noise token down. So Anna found this key, and instead of placing it into a item slot in front of Anna, we're going to put that onto the key holder up here. As you can see, there are five slots, and we can simply drop that into one of those slots. And now everyone can see that we have one of the five keys that we need in order to unlock the door. So even though we did not put a noise token down, the killer does see that we gained a key, and they could also see that it comes from this item search deck. So they could probably put two and two together about what happened in this room, but we're okay with that because we did find that key. Well, that's finished all of the survivor's actions, and now we can perform extra actions as well as trade actions if we want, and I think we do want to do that now. As you can see, Anna picked up this adrenaline during the last discovery step, and that is an extra action that would let her move one more space. I think it's pretty likely the killer can put two and two together and assume that there's going to be a survivor in the gallery that just picked up an item. So getting out of the gallery before the killer goes over here and searches is definitely in our best interest. So yeah, let's spend the adrenaline and we're going to put it here into the discard pile. And then we could go here, there, or there. The first thing that comes to mind is if we head over here to the trail, we're going to be just three spaces away from the greenhouse, which is another place that we can search for items. Now, this block token means the killer also knows that is a high priority pass for the survivors to take, considering that's why they put the blocking token down. So one thing we could do instead is move Anna back into the main hall and then maybe move her towards this living room. Unfortunately, we'd have to do another regular move to get there and then perform this action later on. So I'm not sure if that's actually going to be worth it to us. Oh, another option that we have available to us is we can move into the reading room and just kind of sneak past the killer. The killer probably won't see that coming. It's likely they won't search first, and that would give Anna the possibility of breaking down this barricade on her next turn. That is one of the action options, and I think that's what we're going to try to do. Let's be sneaky and try to find a way to this greenhouse that is not the way that the killer might expect. Now, I do want to reiterate that the survivors can always move onto and through the location with the killer, and the killer does not see them unless they perform a search action. These survivors are pretty sneaky in this house. That's the only extra action we're going to take, so now we can move to the discovery step, and I think let's have Marco draw these two cards and keep one of them. It seems somewhat likely that the killer might make it over there and attack Marco during their next turn, and this might help Marco out. So again, they're going to draw these two cards and choose one, and these are both great. This whiskey bottle right here can be used as an extra action, and then it's discarded, and it says you put a noise token into an adjacent location. So you can throw the bottle into another room to try and lead the killer astray. The other card that they drew is a hatchet. Now this is a weapon. We can see it adds plus one to defense, or it can be used as an extra action to remove one of those blocking barricade tokens at your location. 
Now, I like the idea of distracting the killer with a whiskey bottle, but considering there might be an attack happening very soon, I think the hatchet makes more sense. Now, I do want to point out that this does not have an infinity symbol on it, so this is a one-time use hatchet. I guess maybe you use it and it gets stuck into the uh, killer or into the furniture of the room as part of the attack, and then you lose it. Either way, Marco has this hatchet now, and now we can move on to the final step of the survivor's turn, where they have to communicate the noise that they made during this turn. It looks like we made noise in the living room and the kitchen, and we tell the killer that. So the killer can place noise tokens down onto the matching parts of their map. And, of course, now think about what this actually means. Now, they were pretty confident that William was here at the start of the survivor turn, but now William could be somewhere else. They certainly make note of the fact that William could have sprinted moving three times to get to the kitchen, although they knew nothing about where Anna or Marco are, and it's entirely possible that one of those characters made their way into the kitchen and did a discovery action that found something metallic. Just like searching, if you find a metallic item when discovering, then you drop a noise token. So it's entirely possible that that could have happened here in the kitchen. Now there are some things the killer can infer. One of those is that they see that a key is found. So they can probably infer that that was picked up here in the gallery. And they have obviously no idea who did that, but they can take one of these tokens and just put it down to say they have a suspicion that there could be a survivor right over here. In fact, it feels somewhat likely to them. Another thing they notice is that there's a noise token in the living room. Now, they can see that that's the only room where the radio can be repaired, and it is true that that noise could have happened from a discovery action, but the killer does know that the survivors are incentivized to repair that radio, so they think it's likely that's what happened. They've decided to put this token down over here to say they suspect a survivor is over there, but in addition to that... They have a radio repair token, as well as a track. Now, this is something they can use to keep track of how many times they think the radio has been repaired. They don't know for sure, but they strongly suspect that it's been repaired once, so they'll put this over here, and their suspicions will be confirmed only once the radio is completely repaired. One last thing they feel pretty confident about is that William is no longer here in the den. They're going to put this X token right there to remind that for themselves, that William was there at the start of the turn, but not necessarily at the end. And they'll keep that in mind as they take their turn. So it's time for them to play any lightning bolt cards they want from their hand. The first one they've decided to play is revving their chainsaw. As you can see, the murderer has this big chainsaw, and down below it does cost them one of their other cards. They've decided to discard this sense card right here. We'll explain how the sense action works later on. And now that says the killer will gain two strength for this entire turn. And they are going to fear all survivors within one range. Now you count range away from the location where the killer currently is. They are at range zero. So range one would be the adjacent spots. So essentially the den, reading room, greenhouse, and gallery, the greenhouse is within range even though there's a barricade here. Now that means every survivor in any of these spots is going to gain a fear token. And that is tracked up here along with the survivor health cards. So the survivors have to take a fear token and put it next to any of the survivors that just gained a fear, which also tells the killer that they are within one range of them. So the survivors have to check, and it looks like Anna is within one range because she's actually in the same room. So that means we're going to take a fear token and put it over here next to Anna's health card. Now let's focus up here and talk about fear a little bit more. As you can see, we covered up a fear icon with that token, and these are important because as you can see, the first fear token goes here, the second one goes there, but then if you were to place a third fear token on a survivor, you don't actually put it down. Instead, you place a noise token where that survivor currently is, and the two fear stay there. So that means when a survivor has two fear, any future fear puts those noise tokens down, which of course is a great way to tell the killer where you are. Another impact of fear is during attacks, survivors roll one less die for each fear they have. During attacks, survivors normally roll four, but of course, if they have two fear, they're only going to roll two out of those four dice. Now, I'll explain how attacking works in more detail later on. The last thing to mention about fear is that certain killers get extra abilities based off of how scared these survivors specifically are. The Butcher doesn't have any of those in particular, but that's a good thing to keep in mind in case you're playing against a different type of killer. Now, once again, the killer can see that Anna just gained a fear token. So the killer knows that Anna is within one space of where the killer is, or of course, potentially on the same location. This also validates their suspicion that William is no longer here in the den, otherwise they would have gained a fear token. 
Now the killer can leave this revving chainsaw face up so that they remember they have plus two strength in all attacks during this turn. And at this point, they're probably assuming that Anna is over here and they're gonna put this token like that to say it. They figured one of the survivors was over here to find that key anyway. And it makes the most sense that it would be Anna considering she just gained a fear token. It looks like that's the only lightning bolt card they want to play. And now they could either play a blue arrow card or they could do two actions. Remember, each of those actions is either a move one or a search action where the killer tries to find any survivors in their location. For this turn, it looks like they've decided to play Quick Search. Now that is a blue arrow card, and it's going to cost another card. They are going to be discarding this barricade to pay for it. And then that says they're going to move once, and then search, and then move again, and then search again. So this is kind of a terrifying card, and they're going to start by moving once into the gallery. They feel pretty confident that Anna is in here, and now they are going to search. Now, the way the search action works specifically is they're going to ask the survivors if any survivors are in this location. Obviously, the killer told the survivors that they moved into the gallery, and now the survivors can tell them that there's actually no one in here, which surprises the killer. They did not expect us to have that adrenaline to get out of the room. They certainly knew it was a possibility, but it was a relatively low possibility of happening. So the killer knows that Anna is not in the gallery, but they know for sure that Anna is either in the gallery, reading room, greenhouse, or den. And considering it wasn't the gallery, that means it's going to be one of these. However, they're pretty confident it's not the greenhouse either, considering how could Anna have actually reached the greenhouse with this barricade in place. So that means it's the reading room or the den. And considering the den is three locations away from the main hall, and considering they know that somebody picked a key up by searching for an item, they are going to deduce that Anna is actually back here in the reading room. We thought we were being sneaky by using the adrenaline to get over there, but we were not expecting the killer to use a quick search in order to do so much on their turn. Normally, if they were just doing a regular turn, they would get those two actions, and they would move here once, and then search, not find Anna, and then their turn would be done, but they have one of these cards in their deck, and they got it early. Now, they are going to use that deduction, and yeah, they're going to head back into the reading room with this second move one, and then search, and this time, they have found Anna. Now, I do want to point out that Anna has an asymmetric ability called Low Profile. That says that she is invisible to the Sense action, but she is not invisible to the Search action. We'll talk about the Sense action in more detail later. It's certainly a good thing to have, but whenever the killer searches a location, they find all survivors there, no matter what their abilities are. So, we truthfully tell the killer that they found Anna, which means they can flip this over. And then we immediately go into the first attack of the game. Anytime the killer searches and successfully finds at least one survivor, an attack happens. Obviously, they have this chainsaw, and they even revved it, which makes it more terrifying. Now, the way attacks work is the targeted survivor can play up to one card from their area in order to help themselves out. If they had multiple cards that could help, they still have to choose exactly one. Now, they don't have to use a card even if they have it, and obviously Anna does not have any cards, so she does not add any to this attack. This means she can move right into dice rolling. The standard dice pool is going to be four of these dice. If we take a look at them, you can see there are two blanks, there are three ones, and a single three. Now, the goal of rolling these dice is the survivor wants to reach a number on all the dice equal to or exceeding the killer's strength. And the killer's strength starts out at five, but of course they revved their chainsaw, which means they add two. So that means Anna needs to get seven or more on these dice in order to succeed with this attack. Now, as I mentioned before, for every fear token a survivor has, they lose a die. And we can put it down here onto this locked symbol to show that. And then it's time to roll the dice using the dice tower that's in the divider between the two players. As you can see, we're essentially tossing these dice into the chimney of the house. It's not too surprising, but that did not go very well. They got a three, which is a one in six chance, but they also got two blanks. That means Anna got a defense of three, but of course the butcher has five plus two from that revving chainsaw or seven strength. So Anna needed seven, which means she needed a three, another three, and at least a one, which is very unlikely to have happened. So unfortunately, the killer wins this combat. This means Anna takes a damage, and we show that by flipping this card over to the damaged side. Now, the only way the killer wins is by killing one of the survivors, and if the damaged survivor takes one more damage, then that will remove this token, killing them, and immediately ending the game with a win for the killer. Obviously, this is not great for us as the survivors. 
So that went great for the killer. Now, I do want to point out that if the survivor had defended, then they would not have taken a damage. But instead, the killer would discard the top two cards from their deck into their discard pile. And obviously, that's not great for the survivors because every time the killer goes through their deck once, they increase in level. So that successful attack against Anna is completed, and at this point, if there were any other survivors in this location, well, the killer would attack them. Now, the order in which the survivors are attacked is dictated by the survivors. Again, this only makes sense if there are multiple survivors in the location when the killer searches. Now, I do want to point out that if any survivor succeeds against the killer, then the overall attack stops, and the killer does not attack anyone else in the room. So, this attack will continue until at least one survivor succeeds, or until every survivor in the room has been successfully attacked. Once all attacks are done, every survivor in the room gets a free one move. All attacks are finished here, so that means Anna can move one space. And <laughs> if Anna takes one more damage, we lose the game entirely. So that, I think, is going to be our priority. I'd love to move Anna back here in order to do another search action, but if we did that, odds are so good that the killer would just walk into the gallery and then attack. Now, that being said, if we searched here and we did not find a key and we did not make noise with that search, then the killer might not know that we were actually on this location. So that is something to keep in mind, but I think we should not play with fire like that. Let's head over to the den, and I think we're going to be moving with Anna once again on her turn, probably just trying to get her away from the killer in some way. Now, it is worth noting that Anna did not have to move, but either way, the killer now knows that Anna is either here in the reading room still, or in the den, or in the gallery. Considering the other information they have, they suspect that William might be up here. They're not really sure, though, so they'll put the question mark down. If that's the case, that means this would be Marco, and they'll put a question mark for that as well. And now, if the killer had not performed an attack, they could play an hourglass card, but they did attack, so they can't do that, which means they can move to the final step of their turn, where they draw three cards from the top of their deck. Looks like they only have three cards left. All right, it's time for the survivors to go again. Now, the first thing that happens is we clear off all of these noise tokens, and if the radio had been fully repaired, we'd move that rescue token, but of course that hasn't happened just yet, and now we can perform actions. I think we should definitely have Marco repair this radio again, and obviously that'll put another noise token down into the living room. The killer is currently three spaces away from Marco, and it's possible the killer could get there on their next turn, but I think that's still worth it, and we know that Marco has this hatchet, which could help them in winning an attack against the killer. Now, we still have to do actions with William and Anna, and for Anna, we have a new option available. Now, this action involves removing all fear from that character. Of course, that means Anna wouldn't move, but that still is pretty powerful. This fear obviously makes it harder for Anna to compete in combat. That being said, I think Anna is just way too close to the killer. I think it's more important to move her. Now, we could try to be creative and move back into the reading room, but in that case, we probably would have just stayed there anyway. And with this move, we can go one or two spaces. So we could go to the banquet hall and just stay there. We could also head back into this hallway, I suppose. And that seems like a pretty decent idea. Uh, if we did that, I think odds are pretty unlikely that the killer spends their turn working their way into the hallway to try and find Anna specifically, especially considering this radio keeps getting repaired and the killer probably wants to stop that from happening. So yeah, I think we'll go over here and then maybe try to move back into this gallery on the next turn to then try and search here once the killer has perhaps moved on. The other person we could do an action with is William, and we'll just have them move one space into storage so that we can find an item on their next turn. That's finished all of our actions, so now we can do the discovery step. And considering inside this deck there are ways to heal, I think let's have Anna draw from the top of the deck. So she will draw the top two cards and keep one of them. Uh, the top one is a flashlight. That says this gives a replace action that lets you travel through a secret passage. Now, this has an infinity symbol, which means you keep it for as long as you want. And with that in mind, let's take a look at this map in closer detail. In the mansion, there are two secret paths, and it's possible you already noticed them. They are labeled A and B. Now, you can only use these if you have a flashlight, and those allow you to move from one of them to the other. So that means the flashlight could be used in the banquet hall in order to use that secret passage to make their way into the garden. And the other one goes from the living room all the way over here to the graveyard. Obviously, that is really versatile and makes me very likely to want to keep this. The other card that Anna could keep instead is Tranquilizer. This is a one-time use card that gives you an extra action that lets you remove all of your fear. 
That is certainly nice to have, but this flashlight seems great, so I think we're going to keep this. Anna can put that into her inventory, the other one will be discarded, and now it's time to communicate our noise to the killer. It looks like we were pretty quiet, we only made one noise this round, and it's in the living room. So the killer can put a noise token over here, and with regards to their knowledge about the other survivors, they think that Anna could be here, but it's pretty unlikely. Anna could be in one of many of these rooms, so they're just going to remove the token. They've also kind of lost the bead on William. They, at least they think William was up here. Uh, William can move up to three times, but of course, if William moved three times, William would have put a noise token down, and it looks like that's unlikely to have happened. So William probably moved a couple of spaces, and they're just going to leave this token kind of here-ish. I mean, they can tell that we want to make our way over here. They don't necessarily know William is there, but it seems like a reasonable thing to deduce. And then over here, they once again see a noise, and they're definitely going to deduce that that was the radio being repaired again. So they're going to move this down because they think the radio has been repaired twice, and now it's time for them to play their lightning bolt cards. The first one they're going to go with is Sense. Now that says they sense all survivors in one zone, and when we take a look at the mansion, we can see that it's split into three different colored zones. The first is green, which is largely outside, but also includes this greenhouse. The second is red, which are all of these locations, and the third is blue, which is these locations along the top, as well as this banquet hall. So that means that the killer chooses one of these, and it does not need to be the zone that they are currently in. Out of all of these, they've decided to sense the blue zone. Now what this means is the survivors have to honestly tell the killer who is in that zone. Looking back over here, the survivors are going to tell them that Marco is in the zone, and they're also going to tell them that William is in the zone, but they don't tell them where, so the killer just knows that those two survivors are somewhere over here. Now, I do want to point out that Anna could be over here as well, at least as far as the killer knows, because Anna does have this low profile effect. That says that she is invisible to the sense action. Now, once again, this is the sense action. So if Anna was here, we would not have to say that Anna is in this zone. That also means if the killer had sensed in the red zone, we would say that they don't sense anything, even though Anna does happen to be in here. So the killer knows that Marco and William are in the blue zone, and they had a reasonable suspicion of this, and that is just going to be clarified. They do think it's likely William is at least over here. They know someone was likely in the kitchen in the last round, and it seems unlikely that that person would have moved over here, especially considering how badly the survivors want to find keys. So they're not 100% on this, but they have a reasonable suspicion. Over here, they're pretty much positive that that's got to be Marco. Next up, they're going to play Pursue. That gives them a move one, and they're going to move once into the gallery, and that's going to finish their lightning bolt cards. Now, they're not going to play any blue arrow cards, so that means they'll get two standard actions. With each one of these, they can move or search, and they could search here. They're assuming that we're not going to be that bold to put Anna back over here, and they feel pretty confident that Marco is up there, and they do want to stop us from actually repairing that radio. So they're going to spend the first of those actions moving into the main hall, and the second action moving into the living room. That's finished their actions, and since they did not attack, they could play an hourglass card if they had one in their hand, but they've decided not to, and that means they can finish their turn by drawing three cards from the top of their deck, and that actually drew the last of the cards from their deck. Now, I mentioned before that drawing through the deck is going to move them up in level, but they only do that when they go to draw a card and they don't have any cards left. So that's not going to happen just yet, and that has finished the killer's turn. Well, the first thing the survivors have to do is clear off noise, and it looks like Marco is not going to be repairing this radio again this turn. Remember, you can't do this action if the killer is in the same room. So instead, Marco is going to have to get out of here. I figure, let's just move Marco two spaces, heading down here to the gallery. Then let's have Anna move one space into the gallery, and then let's have William pick up an item in the storage closet. It looks like he found a toolbox. That is definitely metallic. That clanks around, which means we do put a noise token down in the storage closet. And then it says at the radio location, you can do a special action that adds plus two to the repair progress, and you still put a noise token down. That is incredible. Wow. Okay, that is really good to have, even though it puts some noise down. That will really help us with trying to repair this radio quickly. So William takes this toolbox. And at this point, we've finished all of our main actions, but we once again have a step where we can perform extra actions and trade items back and forth between each other. 
Currently, Anna and Marco are together in the gallery, which means Marco could give Anna this hatchet, and of course Anna could give Marco this flashlight. I think we're okay keeping these over here for now. Marco also has this med kit, which I think is going to be pretty important next round, but Marco's the only one who can use this item, so he's not going to be passing this on. This means we can move on to the discover step, and I think let's have Anna draw again. So she's going to draw the top two cards, and ooh, she found a short sword. This adds plus one to defense, which means you just add one to every die roll that a player with a short sword uses during combat. And that does have an infinity symbol, so it sticks around, unlike the hatchet, which can only be used once, but of course the hatchet can also be used to break down those blockades. Now the other card Anna drew is Limestone Powder. That is a one-time use plus two defense card, and I think the plus one forever is probably going to be better in this instance. We'll have Anna keep the short sword, and we'll discard the Limestone Powder. Well, the last thing the survivors have to do is tell the killer that they made noise in the storage room. So the killer can put a noise token down over there and feel pretty good about the fact that the radio was not repaired, obviously because they were sitting in that room. Now, again, the only way the killer wins is by killing one of the survivors, and they obviously don't want the survivors to repair this radio. Now, they have a reasonable suspicion that Marco is no longer in this room. It really wouldn't make sense to leave Marco over there when there are other things to have happen. Of course, it is possible, but they're going to assume Marco probably isn't over there. They are going to assume that William is over here, considering a noise token was placed down. That seems likely that a metallic object was found when looking through those items. So the killer can now play their lightning bolt cards, and they're going to begin with a pursue card. That lets them move once, and they're going to move into the dining room. Then they're going to play stay. Now this costs a card, and they're actually going to discard another revving chainsaw card, and then that says they can barricade one or two doors at their current location. They've decided they are going to be barricading this door that goes from the dining room into the living room, and then they are also going to be barricading the door between the dining room and the kitchen because they want to make it harder for this player to potentially get back over here. They know that we are still incentivized to try and repair that radio. After that, they're done with their lightning bolt cards, and now they could play a blue card or do two actions, and they're going to do the two actions. They've decided to move once, and then they're going to search in the main hall. They don't have the highest suspicions that there's somebody here, but it's possible Marco might have moved one space over until the killer left to then move back into the living room and continue repairing that radio. So the killer searches over here, and the survivors tell the killer that the killer doesn't find anybody. Remember, if Anna was here, the killer would still find her. She is only invisible to the sense ability, not search. Well, that's finished both actions for the killer, and now they can play a hourglass card because they did not perform any attacks. This is Barricade, which lets them block one door at their location, and they are going to block this one between the main hall and the living room. So this turn was all about impeding the movement of the survivors. Now, both of the doors into the living room have blockades in front of them. Now, it is possible for the survivors to spend an entire action removing one blockade from the room they are currently in, although when they do that, they tell the killer that, and that obviously lets the killer know that the survivor is going to be in one of those two rooms. Well, the killer can finish their turn by drawing three cards from the top of the deck, but they don't have a deck. That means they have to shuffle up their discard pile into a new deck, and every time they do this, they are going to increase their level once. They were at level one, so that's going to bring them up to level two, and we can take a look at their player board to see that when they go from level one to level two, that will permanently increase their strength by one. So they started with five, and now they've gone up to six for every attack for the rest of the game, and of course they can add to that with things like their revved chainsaw. Now if we take a look at this card, when they go to level three, they're going to unlock Brutal Rage. That is a card over here in the locked spot of the board, and when they unlock this, it goes directly into their hand. This is a lightning bolt card that costs another card in order to be played. It increases their strength by one this turn, and then it lets them move once and search. Obviously, this is a very scary card, allowing them much more mobility as they move around the mansion trying to find and kill us. Fortunately, they don't have access to that just yet, so they can shuffle their discard pile into a new deck and then draw three cards, and that has finished their turn. So the survivors can start their turn by removing their noise tokens and now perform actions. Now, it'd be great to get William into this uh, living room because they have this toolbox, which would repair the radio twice instead of the normal once, but that is going to be very hard to do with a couple of blockades in the way. 
Once again, if a survivor is in a location that has a blockade, they can spend their entire action removing that blockade and then communicating that over to the killer. That isn't the case right now for William, though, and they are here in storage, so they could just look in that item deck. It's possible that we could just do that three times, I suppose, on this turn, although the killer is quite close to Anna. You know, with that in mind, I think we're going to start by having Marco do a special action, which will activate their med kit. This is an item they start the game with, and it's a one-time use. Obviously, it says Marco only, and they can use this special action to do a heal action at their location and remove all fear from the target. Now, this can only hit somebody at their location, and they could target themselves, but they've decided to target Anna. Again, this only happens because Anna is in the same location, and when a character is healed, we simply flip their card back, and then, of course, that med kit removed all of the fear. So that was a pretty good use of it, but again, we only get access to this once per game, and if we are playing with Marco. This was also a special action, and that means that was Marco's action. So we just have to do an action with Anna, and considering she's in the gallery, I think we should take this opportunity to look into that item deck again, even though the killer is right here. So she can draw the top card, and we found another key. Awesome. We can place that right up here at the top, although that does communicate to the killer that that happened. And now we still have to do an action with William, and I think let's have them look into that item deck again. It looks like they found Herbal Medicine. Okay, this gives a special action that lets them heal in their location, but it does add a noise. So that's certainly something good to have. And we'll put that over here into William's inventory. I do want to mention that if a survivor has all three of their inventory slots full and they gain a new item, they can discard a previously held item to make space for it. Well, that's finished our main actions, and I don't think we have any extra actions or item swapping that we want to do, so now it's time for the discovery step. And I think we'll have Marco draw this time. So they're going to draw the top two cards of the discovery deck, and they found, ooh, Firecracker. This is a special action, so it takes that whole action, but it says you make noise in all locations. Now, technically, we don't have to put a noise token down into every single location on the map. We would simply tell the killer that there's a noise token at every location on the map, so they would know a firecracker happened, and that would be a really good way to disguise the other things that we're doing, particularly noisy things. Now, the other item they could potentially take is a tranquilizer, which lets them use an extra action to get rid of all fear, and I think they're going to keep the firecracker. All right, that's finished all our actions, so we can tell the killer that we made no noise at all this round. I do want to point out once again that the key normally makes noise, but Anna was the one who picked it up, and she does not put noise down when performing those search for item actions. So the killer now gets to go, and they do see that a second key was found, and they have a strong suspicion that William is in the storage, so there is certainly an argument to be made that uh, William was the one to find it. They didn't see any other noise, so they're not really sure where Marco or Anna went. They don't have any reason to suspect that they're in the gallery beyond the fact that the gallery is just a really good place to be because it's another spot to find those items. It's also possible the survivors thought that was too risky, and they started heading over here to make their way to the greenhouse, which which currently feels a little bit safer because it's farther away from the killer. Now the killer can perform their actions and they're going to start with a pursue. That gives them one move and they are going to head down here to the gallery. I do want to point out that the killer can move through these barricades, but if they do, they remove the barricades. So they could be heading up there to William, but they kind of want to leave this barricade here to stall out the movement of the survivors. So they'd rather move this way and kind of pin the survivors against these barricades, which will obviously slow them down. At this point, the killer has decided to stop playing cards. They have two cards in their hand and they're going to draw three, and they have a hand limit of five. So currently they don't feel a huge reason to play these especially considering those cards they feel could be better for them later. And they do have a suspicion that there could be somebody here. So they've decided to do two actions, and they'll start with a search, just on the off chance the survivors are being risky and staying in the gallery. Obviously, that is the case. We decided to go risky, so we now tell the killer that both Anna as well as Marco are in this location, and we're now about to have another fight. I think we'll start with Anna fighting the butcher, and Anna can use one item, and of course she's going to use this short sword. That's going to add plus one to her defense. Currently Anna does not have any fear, which means she's going to be rolling four dice. And the butcher has a strength of six, so that means she needs to roll five or better on these dice, because of course she's going to add one to this die roll with her short sword. So let's see what she gets. Ooh, that did not go very well. 
she got two blanks and two ones. So that is two plus one from the short sword, which is three. So that is not going to be six or better, which means she does take a damage. It's a good thing Marco healed her, otherwise the game would end immediately because that would have been her second damage. But she is once again going to flip this over to the damaged side. And because she was not successful, the Butcher is now going to attack Marco. And Marco does have this hatchet, which gives them an extra action, which lets them remove a barricade from their location. They could also use this in order to gain one defense. And considering they haven't actually taken a damage yet, they are going to hold onto this and not use it for the defense. They don't think it's likely it would help out anyway, and being able to remove a blockade for an extra action instead of a main action could be imperative as we try to get those blockades down. So they're going to roll all four dice, and they need a six or better. They got... Oh, wow! <laughs> 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1, 8. Well, it's a good thing they didn't use that hatchet because they did not need it. Again, they just needed to meet or exceed 6, and obviously 8 does that. That was a great roll, so they have succeeded. This means Marco does not take a damage, and that also means if there was any other survivors in here, they would not be attacked because that success finished all of these attacks. Because a survivor was successful in an attack, that does mean that the killer is going to draw the top two cards from their deck and immediately discard them. It looks like they lost a barricade and one of their revving chainsaws. The attack is over, and that means all of the survivors may move once. Now, I think we should move Anna onto the trail. That's one space away from the graveyard, which has a secret passage into the living room, which would let us essentially bypass these barricades that the killer put up. The killer does not know that we have a flashlight just yet, although I suppose if we start making noise in this room, they would figure that out. We have to move Marco as well, and considering I think that's going to be our plan to get into the living room, let's move Marco to the trail as well. Maybe we can head him over here to the greenhouse, although it's likely the killer's going to be chasing us outside now as we head over here. Speaking of that, it's still the killer's turn, and they've only used one of their two actions. Remember, they used a lightning bolt pursue to go from the main hall into the gallery. So they have one action left, and they are indeed going to move from the gallery onto the trail. Uh, for no other reason than they want to make it over here, and to try to pressure William to try and go that way, and waste time making it through this barricade. They also strongly suspect nobody else is remaining in here, although it's possible one of us decided to hide at the end of that attack. At this point, the killer can't play an hourglass card even if they wanted to, because they did do an attack. So they can finish their turn by drawing three cards from this deck that's already getting pretty small, because of course they discarded a couple of cards since the survivors won that attack. Alright, it's the survivors' turn again, and there is no noise to clear, and let's move right into actions. Alright, it's the survivors' turn again, and we don't have any noise to clear. Now before we do main actions, I think let's do the first item swap of the game. Anna is in the same location as Marco, and I think we are going to give Marco this short sword. The reason for that is because Anna is going to use that flashlight to use that secret passageway, so it's unlikely Anna is going to be in combat for a little while. Now that might seem counterintuitive considering Anna has already taken a damage, but by the time the killer realizes Anna has used this secret passage, it's likely the killer is way over here, and the killer cannot use secret passages themselves. So we would hopefully have time to maybe repair this radio, remove a blockade, and then get out of there. Or, of course, we could use the secret passage again once the killer gets close. I think that makes Anna slippery enough to not worry about defending her in a straight-up fight. All right, now let's perform actions, and let's start with that move. We'll have Anna move one two spaces using this secret passage. Again, they can only do that because they have this flashlight. Next up, let's have Marco move, and I think it's pretty simple. We'll go one, two, heading over here probably to the greenhouse. Finally, we can see William is still in the storage closet, and the killer's way over here. I think let's look for another item. Hopefully we'll find another key. It looks like we found a whiskey bottle. Okay, we've seen this already. That lets us use an extra action to toss it in order to make one noise. So we'll put that over here, which is the last spot for William to hold items. Well, that's finished all of our main actions, and now it's time for the discovery step. Uh, we might want to have Anna do this again because there is the possibility of healing from this deck. There's also a possibility that she finds a toolbox. Uh, she's in the living room already, and that would be pretty amazing. So let's draw from the top. 
Oh, nice. That worked out pretty well. Uh, this is a tranquilizer, which lets us get rid of fear, which normally is pretty good, but we found a key. Now, inside this discovery deck, there are only two keys, whereas inside of this deck, there are five. Now, once again, we need to find five keys total, and finding one of them in here will certainly help us in our progress. Obviously, finding keys is great. However, there is a negative silver lining to this, and that is the fact that they make noise. Now, Anna's meticulous effect means she does not make noise when searching, but this is a discovery step, not a search. So that means she will make noise in the living room, and that means we have given away the fact that we have a flashlight to use these secret passageways one turn before I wanted to. I was really hoping that the killer would be over here by the time we gave that away. But unfortunately, this is what happened. Again, finding a key is a good thing, but it's possible the killer might change their plans now that we found a way around their barricades. So the survivors can end their turn by unfortunately telling the killer that somehow noise happened in the living room. So they can put a noise token over there, and they also have a reasonable suspicion that Marco is probably over here. Marco was in this spot, and maybe they'll just do that, because they know Marco's probably in this general location. It might not even be worth it for them to put this token down, but they'll still put it over here. Now, I do want to point out that those whiskey bottles let you make noise in an adjacent location, and you are allowed to throw a whiskey bottle through a barricade. You might not be able to fit, but you can get your hand and that bottle through. So it's entirely possible that we were able to use a whiskey bottle to throw it through a barricade in order to try and make the killer think that we have that flashlight to get into the living room. That being said, the killer is closer to the living room than they are to the storage, and they've decided it's more likely we have that flashlight, and they've decided to start their card playing with a pursue. That is going to give them one move action, and they're going to head back here to the gallery, and that will be it for their lightning bolt attacks, and then they are going to discard a barricade in order to play quick search. This is really bad for us. They only have one of these in their deck, although their deck is not that big, so it's not that surprising that they were able to find it again. Now, this says instead of doing their normal two actions, they get to move once, search, move again, and then search again. And they are gonna start by moving to the main hall and searching. We have nobody in here, so we obviously tell them that. And then they're gonna move again, busting through this barricade into the living room. Now that removes the barricade, which puts it back into the supply. And of course, we remove that barricade from our side. And once they are in here, they are going to search. We thought we were being so sneaky with that flashlight, and it might have doomed us. We even got rid of the short sword from Anna giving it to Marco. Well, at this point, we do tell the killer that they found Anna, and remember, Anna is already wounded. So, an attack happens immediately, though fortunately, Anna is no longer scared. So, she is going to roll all four of her dice. That being said, if she does not get a six or better with this roll, the survivors immediately lose the game. She got four. No! That wasn't enough. That's going to do one damage, and since she was already wounded, we remove this token, and the game ends. The killer successfully killed somebody, and it was Anna Kubrick. I felt like we were doing so well as the survivors. We had a toolbox with William to potentially repair this quickly, or just be sneaky and try to repair this the last couple times while the killer is over here, maybe not worrying about that so much, and we had three out of the five keys that we needed to win the other way, simply going over to the main hall and exiting through an unlocked door. So we weren't super close, but I feel like we had a really good plan, and unfortunately, finding that key doomed us. So once again, the killer wins and we lose as the survivors. Now, at this point, before I wrap up the tutorial, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the butcher and then also give a brief overview for the other two killers that I currently have. Now, we can look at the butcher. If they made it to level four, they'd gain another strength. And if they made it to level five, which is the last one, then they would damage all targets instantly when they encounter survivors. Then they continue with the attack phase. So just by successfully searching, they do a damage. And because of that, it is really bad to have a killer at level five. So that's essentially a counter on the game because they level up every time they go through the deck. And the more time we take to accomplish our goals, the stronger that killer becomes. Well, at this point, let's briefly talk about the other two killers that we have. The first of these is the Murderer. Now, they have some cards in their deck that we haven't seen just yet, and one of the abilities they have access to is Stealth. Now, that says Stealth 0 to 2, and whenever the killer activates Stealth, 
their miniature is removed from the survivor side and placed on the stealth area over here, while on the other side, the killer moves zero to two spaces. Now, that is going to last for one turn, because on the killer's next turn, they are going to reappear wherever they are and immediately search as part of that action. So they essentially disappear and reappear with a free search action, which could cause an attack, and the survivors won't know where they are. It essentially puts the survivors in the killer's shoes for a little bit. When we look at their level up effects, they lean into the stealth with this murderer. It says plus three strength if you encounter any survivors when you reappear, and at level three they unlock swift slaughter, which is terrifying. It gives them a stealth of again zero to two, and then when they appear, they kill all survivors within one range. So if the survivors see swift slaughter played, they have to run. At higher levels, the murderer gains even more strength and is able to block various things immediately when they hit that level. And at the final step, they're once again going to be doing damage to all survivors before they actually attack them. I want to point out another great card the murderer has, which is Murder Notice, which just fears all survivors no matter where they are. Lastly, let's take a quick look at the Spectre. Now, the Spectre's strength is low. It's only three compared to the five that starts out for the Butcher and the four of the Murderer, but the uh, Spectre is very mobile and they can also stealth. We can see they have this Vanish card, which says they stealth and then move zero to two spaces, and then they fear all survivors within one range when they reappear. They also have a couple of these whizzing by cards. That lets them move one to four spaces, so incredibly fast, and then they fear all survivors in the path, including their starting location. So the Spectre whizzes through the mansion, terrifying every survivor they come in contact with. Obviously, that will give the Spectre a bunch of information as well if they whiz by and then put a couple of fear tokens down. Speaking of fear, they have this Trail of Tears card that says all survivors with at least one fear have to reveal their location. So even having one fear against the Spectre can be terrifying when it comes to actually trying to hide. Speaking of that, when Spectre reaches level 4, which is pretty late on, they will unlock Drain Life. This damages all survivors with at least one fear. So once again, being fearful when the Spectre is out there, it's really bad, especially if you go late in the game, because obviously if a survivor already has one damage and then they have their life drained, that will instantly win the game for the Spectre. Now let's take a look at some of the other level up benefits. We can see at level one, they fear all targets when you encounter them. And again, that encounter happens when you successfully search. So fear is a big part of the Spectre's play. At level two, they say after they whiz by, they may discard two cards in order to do a search action. And while that does cost a couple of cards, that could be great when it comes to adding more fear and attacking. At level three, it says whenever a survivor's fear is overwhelmed, they may discard three cards to damage the target. So if the Spectre plans accordingly, when a survivor gains too much fear, that is another way for them to do damage without even having dice rolled. At level 4, they unlock that life drain, and finally at level 5, we can see they damage all targets instantly when they encounter them and then go to the attack phase, just like the level 5 effect for the other killers. At this point, we really are just about done with the tutorial, but I will end this by showing a couple of effects that we didn't actually see. Uh, Marco has a special action called Resourceful that says we can gain an Adrenaline or a Tranquilizer from the discard pile. We had uh, multiple Tranquilizers and uh, at least one Adrenaline in there. Again, Adrenaline gives us that extra move, so that is a pretty nice way to get access to those very versatile effects. Obviously, we did not actually get a chance to use that. Now, we did not play with Sophia Scott, but she starts with this camera. The camera is right over here, and that gives them an extra action, which puts a noise token down in their location. This can be used great for distractions. Now, she also has Observative, which says that she has a new special action that says she can always travel through secret passages. She does not need a flashlight. It also says this becomes an extra action if she is holding the flashlight. Remember, normally you have to move as a main action, but she's even quicker with that flashlight. Now, the last one to look at is Johnson Nispel. They have an extra large backpack. It says they do not have a limitation for the number of items they can hold, and Engineering Expert says they gain plus one extra repair progress when they repair a radio using a toolbox. Remember, the toolbox lets you repair it twice, and obviously that means Johnson would repair it three times for using this toolbox, and you only need to do it five times before it is fully repaired. Well, at this point, I've covered just about all of the rules to the game, so that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Terrorscape.
As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.